Now, it's quite interesting following on from a speech about body image, because I bet a few of you are looking at me now thinking, well, she doesn't really look much like a rower, does she? <laughs> and you'd be absolutely right. Um, I'm never going to win a prize as a competitive rower. Uh, <laughs> dragon boating is a bit different. So you can imagine when my best friend Lynn and I decided we were going to row across the Atlantic, there were a few sort of raised eyebrows. So we asked um, a lady called Ellen MacArthur, a round-the-world record-breaking solo sailor, for her take on the challenge we were about to, to do. So this is just a message for Rachel to wish her all the best for their transatlantic row race attempt. It's going to be an awesome challenge. Not only are you getting on a tiny boat to row all the way across the Atlantic, but it's something that you can't step off from. It's a huge challenge. There's going to be lack of sleep, horrendous motion in the storms, very, very cold sometimes. And I think, on the whole, the length of time that you're out there, that's going to be the biggest challenge. But I've never done that. I'm not sure if I would do that. So all the best, Rachel, and fingers crossed. So Ellen MacArthur said, I'm not sure I'd do that. <laughs> Right, so we had a bit of a challenge. The challenge was 3,000 miles from the Canaries to the Caribbean. It's in a seven metre boat and it, we estimated it would take 70 to 100 days. There's quite a lot of things out there that can kill you. Things with big teeth, <laughs> um, shipping and probably your partner after that length of time at sea. <laughs> And to put it in some perspective, at the time that we did this, 187 women had been to the top of Mount Everest. 50 women had been into outer space, but only 46 had ever rowed any ocean, and Lynn and I were the 43rd and 44th. Now, it kind of started with this lady, Deborah Searle. Now, Deborah was a friend of ours from our dragon boating days, and she'd set out to row across the Atlantic with her husband. To cut a long story short, they took him off the boat. He had to be rescued. Deborah carried on alone. And when she got back, she kept saying to Lynn and myself, you know, you should think about this. You're the right sort of person. Rachel, you'd love it out there. And we sort of said, no, no, couldn't. How, how could we do that? Can't do it. And yet when we sat down and said, actually, if Deborah did it on her own, surely between the two of us, we stand a chance. And the question we asked ourselves is, what's stopping us from doing this? And it's a really powerful question. Any challenge you face, ask yourself, what's stopping me? And it helps you to focus in and find the solution to that problem. In our case, it was the money. It costs £70,000 to do something like this. And we just didn't have that sort of money. Normal girls, mortgages, rent, pay, didn't have the money. But it helps us to focus on ways to raise that money. There was another reason that we took on the challenge as well. Um, both our families had been affected by breast cancer and we decided to raise money for a charity along the way. Now, you'd think they'd be really grateful, wouldn't you? But the first time we met them, <laughs> the question they asked us was, well, what if the only publicity we get is an upturned boat and two dead rowers? <laughs> and they kind of had a point. You know, that was a very real potential outcome. Um, but I think it was our professionalism and, and, you know, we convinced them that we were going to be capable women and, and take on this challenge. So they allowed us to represent them. Now, it took us three years from that point to actually get to the start line. And with any campaign like this, you sit down and you write your goals. Getting to the start line was one. Getting across safely was another. Stepping off as best friends was really important to us, along with raising the money for the charity. And we split it down into a number of different areas. So we, we looked at the physical side, the mental side, the technical, and of course the fundraising. Now the physical side was probably the easy bit. We had to learn to row. Um, and then once we'd learned to row, we had to learn to row a one-ton boat on bumpy water. Um, not too difficult, really. And we had to be able to row for two hours non-stop. The mental side was the bigger challenge. Probably something like this is 95% all up here. And we worked with a coach and we looked at things like strategies for dealing with all the pressures we would face out at sea. So stress, anxiety, pain, fear, lack of space, lack of sleep. And we worked out strategies for all of those kind of things. We also um, had to get ready technically. And we had to learn all the systems on the boat and be able to fix everything. Because when you're 1,500 miles from the nearest land, you've got to do it yourself. Fundraising wise, we went up and down the country. We towed the boat everywhere and we became a, a road show for breast cancer care. And along the way, people shared their stories with us as well. 
And that was really important because those were the, the stories that we locked away and then used to help motivate us when we had a down day. Eventually, though, we made it to the start line, so that was one of our goals ticked off. And I remember that last day walking down to the boat with Lynn, and it was a real mixture of emotions. We actually just wanted to go, to leave the craziness of the three years behind us and get out on the water and do what we wanted to do. But as I hugged my mum goodbye, and she's got tears pouring down her face, I remember feeling really guilty. And I realised that to do any challenge like this, you actually have to be quite selfish. <laughs> and you have to be to be successful at it. But I think you also have to acknowledge that when you head off down a route like this, you're taking a lot of other people with you, whether they like it or not. So I just had to sort of hope that mum would be proud of me when or if I got to the other side. <laughs> now, as soon as we got out to sea, we had a little bit of seasickness, but settled into our routine pretty quickly. We rode for two hours on and two hours off, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We ate twice a day, and it's pretty simple. You eat, you sleep, you row, and you survive out there. Night times were kind of tricky, though. On nights like this one, where there's no stars, it's like rowing in a void. You can't see anything. All you can hear is a rumble, like a train coming down the tracks towards you, and you know there's a big wave on the way. You just pray that you're lined up correctly so it doesn't turn the boat over. In contrast, though, the clear nights were incredibly beautiful. You could see every star in the sky, satellite shooting stars and phosphorescence in the water. And it was an amazing place to be then. But right from the start, the conditions were, were rough. You know, the waves were 20, 30 feet on a regular basis. And we had some electrical problems, which really tested our, our ability. Um, rewiring a circuit board mid-Atlantic is not something I ever thought I'd end up doing. And, um, and, and we questioned it, you know, we said, well, this, this isn't what we expected. The other rowers said it was really sunny, you took all your clothes off and you got an all over tan. <laughs> this isn't what we expected. And then we kind of said, well, really, girls, middle of the Atlantic, what were you expecting? And actually, it didn't matter. This is what we'd got. So we just had to find a way to deal with what we got and hope that we get the all over tan later on. And we adapted as we went along. Um, and it is, a, it is a funny thing because when it's hard, you know, you, you're pushed out of your comfort zone a bit and you feel a bit, a bit awkward. And then if you stay there for a while, it kind of catches up with you. And that comfort zone moves with you. So by taking that step out a bit, it broadens the comfort zone so that you can do more things. Uh, and that's my hands after a month at sea, which did adapt <coughs> and they hardened up and they were absolutely fine. It wasn't all hard, though. <laughs> um, the days when we saw some wildlife really lifted our spirits, and there were lots of other things that, that really made our day. We loved playing games out there as well. Um, I Spy, not perhaps the best one, um, but we loved listing all the food that we were missing from home. Now, we actually had Christmas, New Year, both our birthdays, and Valentine's Day out at sea in the end. Um, <laughs> so you think we'd be sick of each other by the end. Um, and it was really hard. Emotionally, mentally, physically, we were utterly, utterly exhausted. And even, you know, having a little baby bottle of champagne at New Year did very little to lift our spirits because Lynn had picked up an injury and it made it very difficult for her. She was in a massive amount of pain and we were both missing home. And New Year's Day was probably one of the toughest days because she actually contemplated giving up. She didn't. And... Somebody said to me once that whales can sense distress. I have no idea if they can or they can't. But it was on our lowest days that the whales came to visit. And these guys are big. <laughs> they were bigger than our boat. Um, and they got really close as well. You know when you go to the zoo and you're looking at the animals? It's kind of the other way round. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> one day uh, we had a mum and a baby whale came along. You could just imagine this little conversation under the water. Like, Junior, come and look at this two naked women in a pink boat. You're never going to see this again. So again, the whales really helped us. Now, it wasn't all big visitors. We had some barnacles on the bottom of the boat. So one of us, guess which one drew the short straw, ended up um, having to jump over the side into 5,000 metres of water and scrape the bottom of the boat. And no, I couldn't touch the bottom. 
Now, my reward for doing that was the first hair wash that either of us had had in six weeks. Because of the electrical problems, every bit of water that we could use, make using the water maker had to be used for drinking. So washing our hair was a major treat. Anyone ever tells you that your hair self-cleans after six weeks, take it from me, <laughs> they're lying. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> Now, there were lots of things that kept us going, and, and we did set goals for ourselves on the way across. Um, this was the halfway point, um, with a slightly large wave behind us. And you can see it's a <laughs> slightly bigger bottle of champagne for the halfway point. But the point I'm trying to make is that we all set goals for ourselves, but it's very rare that we acknowledge that achievement that w you know, when we've done it. So when you do set a goal, make sure that you give yourself a pat on the back when you achieve it, because really no one else is going to do it for you, only you can do that. And so we made sure that whenever we, we hit a milestone, you know, whether it was a distance or something else, that we made sure we acknowledged that achievement. Towards the end of the race, we actually got pushed 60 miles off course, and getting back onto course was one of the toughest things. One day we rode solidly for 11 hours and went one mile. At the end of that 11 hours when we stopped rowing, we went backwards again. And it was a really soul-destroying time. And it got worse. With just 300 miles to the finish line um, on a really rough day out at sea, a wave that was probably the same height as the building in here broke over the side of the boat and it rolled us over 360 degrees. Now, you might think that was pretty scary. And, and looking back, it was. But at the time, it was ridiculous. Two of us bobbing around in the middle of the ocean, catching our dinner as it floated past. And, and we actually laughed about it. And, and I think that's a key thing. We all have lots of bad situations, but quite often you can find some humour in there somewhere. And we got back in the boat and we carried on and decided to continue to the end. We told the race organiser what had happened, we didn't tell our families, they were getting excited about coming to Antigua and it was a real strain in that last week to keep that news from them. The only other person we told was Deborah and her advice was, your movie doesn't end this way. And we went back to the coaching we'd done and we ran in our heads the, the film of arriving in Antigua, what it would feel like to step onto dry land for the first time, what would it look like to see everyone there waiting for us. And what would it sound like hearing other voices for a change? And, you know, we sort of built that picture up in our minds and that really helped to get us through the last week. This is our fifth day of the storm type force wind blew up last night. So we put the sea anchor out again. This one's about to fly off. And that was a wave hitting the side of the boat. Struggling with power as well because we've had no sunshine for the three or four, four days, days we've been out here. around the wrong way and twist my finger up again. Yeah. Not again. And when we saw Antigua, I think that was the first time we allowed ourselves to think we might have actually done this. 
We crossed the finish line in a time of 76 days, 11 hours and 12 minutes. And we didn't know it at the time, um, even as we moored up, it was, it was quite a time afterwards, but we'd actually set a new British women's world record for rowing across the Atlantic Ocean. Getting out onto dry land is a bit of a challenge and it takes you a while to adjust physically and mentally back to, to real life. And we actually spent the next year still fundraising for the charity, uh, which meant that we were able to give breast cancer care over £65,000 at the end of the day. I'm going to leave you with a little phrase that someone sent to me on, on Facebook a few weeks ago and it kind of sums it up really. It said, life starts the minute that you step out of your comfort zone and it's absolutely true. So what I'm going to challenge you all to do today is pick your ocean. It doesn't have to be a real one, <laughs> um, but choose your goal. Ask yourself what's stopping you from achieving it. Work out the solution, go and do it and enjoy the reward at the end. Thank you very much.